Okay, I don't want to put us too late off our schedule. I know probably a, a fair number of you have a hard stop at 4.30. Um, so I will start by saying welcome everybody. Uh, we have people here from all corners of Ontario and beyond, uh, including I noted in, in looking at participants from the Toronto area, the Ottawa area, which we always have interest from, from Ottawa Carleton, from Fergus, Muskoka, and, uh, and even from Glengarry, uh, which is a place that has a special, special role in my heart. Um, it's been a strange year, but it's really a pleasure to have you with us at this sort of online iteration of the Summer Law Institute, which has been such an important event for us and such an, op an important opportunity for us to connect with you and talk with you and uh, help make sure that you have the opportunity to hear from great people like the speakers that we have for you today. Um, so my name is Michelle Thompson. I'm OGEN's Manager of Legal and Digital Development uh, and our Head of Training for the organization. Um, I'm going to be in the Q&A and the chat today uh, doing, doing my best to uh, handle your questions and resolve any issues that come up. Please feel free to use that function liberally. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, my colleague Christy Pegnuti, who's the lead organizer for this series and who's behind the scenes today holding everything together uh, quite as usual. Um, she'll be resolving technical issues uh, while I work the Q&A. Uh, finally, please join me in welcoming Alan Andrews of Echo Justice. Uh, he is the Program Director for Climate Change. Um, he joined Echo Justice in January 2018. He's a graduate of the University of Manchester uh, and Alan headed the Clean Air Team at Client Earth, which is a UK environmental law nonprofit in London for eight years before that. Um, in the five years prior, he was a solicitor at CMS Cameron McKenna. And his work in Europe has included litigation in the UK Supreme Court and the European Court of Justice while advocating for better pollution laws in Brussels and London. He is passionate about law's potential to empower people to stand up for their right to a healthy environment, uh, including youth, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, I'd just like to offer a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. As I mentioned, if you have any questions or comments at all, please feel free to drop them in the q and I'll be monitoring that. Um, if there are any links to be shared that come up over the course of the presentation, we'll post them in chat, so feel free to keep an eye on that. And this presentation is being recorded, um, so we will post the video and also Alan's PowerPoint and any additional resources that happen to come up over the course of the next hour uh, onto our website. And you'll all receive a link to that uh, along with our feedback survey within a couple of days after the webinar ends. Uh, now, normally, we would begin an event like this with a territorial acknowledgement. Um, OGEN as an organization has been trying really hard to learn more about how to make this practice meaningful as part of our work towards reconciliation. And we've benefited from guidance on this issue from a wonderful Métis lawyer, educator, and reconciliation consultant named Leo Fordzampa, who's done some research into this practice and had a lot of conversations about it uh, with members of her community. And she reminds us that territorial acknowledgements were never meant to be wrote. They weren't meant to be a box that we check or a script that we pull out and read a few times a year, sort of clumsily stumbling over names we haven't bothered to learn. They're supposed to be genuine expressions of gratitude and community with Indigenous people who are the historical and present day stewards of the land we use. And that means they should be particular to each person, each day and each event. So today, uh, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the stewards of this land where I live in Parkdale, Toronto, specifically the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron and Wendat peoples. Uh, I'd like to express gratitude for Lake Ontario and the Humber River, which supports the sparrows, hawks, falcons, and geese I see every day, for the sumac, maple, and oak trees of my street and my yard, uh, the squirrels and raccoons who thrive and adapt in the hostile urban environments we have created for them. I feel special gratitude for the work of Indigenous teachers and educators of all stripes and legal workers and to Indigenous people's ongoing leadership on crucial issues like water protection, environmental preservation, and climate change. Uh, so with no further ado, um, I'd like to turn this over to Alan. Alan, thank you so much for being here and we're very excited to hear about what you guys at Echo Justice have been working on. Well, thank you for that. Uh, kind intro introduction and a, a really thoughtful land acknowledgement. Um, I will uh, first add a few, few words to, to that introduction. Um, that was the, 
the formal bio that, that, that we use on our website, but I think it misses a couple of really important uh, facts about me. Number one, I was actually born in St. Catharines, Ontario, despite my weird English accent. Um, unfortunately, I left St. Catharines, Ontario when I was a, a, a small baby. So uh, I didn't return to Canada until uh, a couple of years ago, as you said. The, the other important fact about me is that my mum was a teacher and there was a point in my life when I was a, a very bored and disillusioned corporate lawyer in London that I did seriously think about becoming a teacher myself. So it's a, uh, a huge honor and, and privilege to be um, speaking to teachers uh, and a little bit intimidating, I've, I've got to say, um, especially when we're doing it um, through through the webinar format, which is something I'm not particularly comfortable with. This is only my second uh, go at this. And I'm very conscious that uh, some in the audience are on our seasoned pros at, uh, at delivering seminars and, and classes um, online. So please bear with me if I'm a little bit clunky in my delivery. Um, I'll get right into it. I'm, I'm hoping to speak for around 30 minutes, but I, I do have a tendency to go off on the uh, odd tangent, so uh, it might not be exactly that. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions. And, and that's the part that I really look forward to, um, where I get get challenged a little bit and uh, have to think on my feet. So let's see how I do. So the title of the webinar is, is Teaching About Matur et al. in High Schools. And, and that's the, one of our landmark signature cases uh, where we are taking the Ontario government to court for its failures to address the climate crisis. Um, but before we go into the details of that particular case, I want to provide a bit more of an overview, a bit more context, and really try and uh, situate that case within the broader context of what's going on in the wider world on climate change. And then we'll have a chance to do a a bit, a bit more depth on the actual case itself, which we can expand on through the Q&A. Um, so I'll start by introducing the clients because that's really what this is all about. They are the stars of the show. Um, there are seven young Ontarians who come from across the province who are united in a passion and commitment and real bravery to hold uh, the Ontario government to account for, for what they see as a, a serious failure to address the climate change and a real concern not only about the climate change that they are seeing themselves right now in Ontario but also about their futures. They're, they're very young people, they will be living with the consequences of climate change for, for decades to come and, and long after I've left this earth. Uh, and they are absolute stars. They're incredible uh, people, young people to work with, really inspirational. I'll say that the press conference we, we did on the, the day that we launched this case back in uh, November was one of my career highlights. Um, I stood on stage um, with, with our clients and was a little bit nervous that they'd be, you know, a bit spooked by the TV cameras and all this sort of stuff, not a bit of it. They got up on stage, told their stories with, with passion and conviction and real authenticity. And it's, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with. Uh, you've heard all about me. Um, let's talk about eco-justice briefly. Um, eco-justice is an, a not-for-profit, it's a, a charity. And essentially, we use the power of law to defend nature, combat climate change, and fight for a healthy environment. Um, and we do that in two main ways. One, we go to court. We bring landmark uh, strategic litigation, uh, mainly holding governments to account to meeting and complying with their legal obligations towards the environment. Um, but we also work on law reform. We work at trying to develop better laws that better protect the climate, better protect nature, and better, better protect our communities from toxic chemicals. Um, so they're the, the, the two tools that we rely on. 
and we are Canada's largest environmental law charity uh, with offices over here in Vancouver where I am on the west coast um, all the way over to, to Halifax on the east coast. But I am in charge of climate change which is a, a fairly uh, <laughs> heavy burden sometimes and uh, a little bit overwhelming uh, but my job as program director is really to lead uh, a team of, of lawyers using law to try and meet the Paris Agreement, which I'm sure is um, something you're all familiar with. The 2015 Paris Agreement was uh, really a, a big win, I think, in terms of climate change. It has its critics, it certainly has its drawbacks, um, but the Paris Agreement commits the world to keeping global warming to two degrees, well, to well below two degrees, I should say, and if possible, to 1.5 degrees. Now, in the, in the years since 2015, when the, the agreement was signed, um, with considerable leadership by Canada, I should say, uh, in the years since, we've seen a wealth of science, scientific evidence around what it actually would mean to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, and it's pretty sobering stuff. Uh, the world as a whole has to halve emissions by 2030 and reach net zero emissions by 2050. Now for a, a large country like Canada, a large wealthy country like Canada that has very high historic emissions of greenhouse gases and very high per capita emissions of greenhouse gas emissions. That is, every Canadian emits a lot of carbon. Uh, that means that Canada's responsibilities are, are even greater than that already really challenging yardstick. So this, the Paris Agreement really serves as eco-justice's lodestar, uh, our mission statement. Our job is to get Canada on the path to 1.5 degrees and do that in a way that that path is really grounded in law, grounded in legislation, grounded in the rule of law, so that we and other Canadians can hold our politicians to account to stay on track in, in what will be some really difficult years ahead. Uh, and I say difficult, really difficult, um, especially when you look at Canada's track record on climate, and it is not a good one. Canada has missed every climate target it has set. Uh, going back to 2000, uh, then there was the, the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, which Canada later pulled out of when it became clear it was not going to meet its targets. Will things get better in the future? Well, not on current progress. Um, this slide shows the, the 2020 Copenhagen target which Canada is set to absolutely smash through. This red line here that you see is, is what will happen uh, with the current emissions trajectory. Down there in the bottom, the yellow diamond is where we need to get to. So we are miles off track and have a lot of really hard work to do. Now, as a, a lawyer, one of the the reasons I, I, I attribute to, to Canada's pretty woeful record on climate is really the quality of its laws. Um, when I came here from, from the UK, I, I came with this impression of Canada as being this very progressive country. I'd seen um, Justin Trudeau swanning around on the international stage and, and uh, Canada's role in signing the Paris Agreement and assumed that Canada's environmental laws and its climate laws would be similarly progressive and, and I'd probably see better laws than I was used to in the UK and Europe and sadly it didn't take me very long to be availed of that notion. Um, Canada's climate laws are, are decades behind other countries, particularly some of the more progressive countries including the UK. Uh, one of the best examples of that is that Canada's climate targets are not in legislation. Some of the provinces have uh, passed legislation committing to certain targets. Ontario is one of them. Um, but as a rule, um, Canada's commitments on climate 
don't find their way onto the, 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 the legislative rule book, which is a real problem because it means we just don't have those legal tools to hold our politicians to account for, for their broken promises. What Canada does have, and I'd, I'd say it's like the, the trump card, is that Canada has the, the Charter of Rights and, and Freedoms. Uh, it has a constitution which guarantees uh, certain rights that Canadians hold as being fundamental. Um, and you'll see this, if you, if you can squint at my slide, you can see some of those rights that are protected, um, rights to mobility, language rights, um, rights guaranteeing um, religious freedoms and freedom against discrimination. But what you won't find on here is any right to an environment, any right to a safe and stable climate. Um, and that's a problem. Um, but fortunately, um, you'll ask why have I got a random picture of a big tree here? Um, it's not just because I'm a tree-hugging lawyer, it's because Canada's uh, constitution is described as a living tree. It's supposed to evolve to changing changes in society, changing social norms. Um, and so unlike in the US where you, you see these um, jurists and scholars saying, arguing that the constitution is fixed in time at the time it was drafted and it must be interpreted as if it was the 1700s. That's not an argument we have in Canada. It's very well settled. That the constitution should evolve. So uh, eco-justice, what we want to see is Canada's constitution evolve to recognize that a stable climate is absolutely fundamental to life on earth and some of these other rights that are explicitly guaranteed by the charter are pretty meaningless if we don't have a, a stable climate uh, and some of the essentials of a healthy environment like clean water and, and clean air so that's what imbues us with a, a real sense of of hope and optimism about canada's uh, climate i'll just flip back a little bit um just to give you a sense of, of the direction of travel in canada um, these are the emissions broken down by different sectors and as you'll see we've canada's been doing okay on in some of these sectors agriculture waste basically remained flat electricity has actually gone down in terms of greenhouse gas emissions uh, and that's largely due to the phase out of coal where ontario has really led the way but it's probably no surprise to see that oil and gas emissions have soared in the last couple of decades uh, and transportation emissions have, have been really a problem as well. When it comes to Ontario, uh, it probably won't surprise you to know that Ontario is, is Canada's second biggest emitter behind Alberta. Um, but it was doing fairly well. Its, its emissions were trending in the right direction. Um, but unfortunately, as I, as I will come on to, uh, things are starting to head very much in the wrong direction. Okay, um, before I start talking about uh, the Eco-Justice um, Ontario case, I, I think it's important to really put that case in its broader context, which is one of uh, a global movement where concerned citizens, often led by youth, are going to the courts and demanding action on climate change. Uh, now these cases are very varied, they're, they're happening in countries all over the world, very different legal systems and, and cultures and societies, but I think one thing they, they do share is a, an idea that we have rights to a stable climate and that con where the country has a constitution that that constitution should uphold those rights. And the, the, the slide uh, I've shown there is, is a reference to probably, well, no, definitely the best example of this kind of case. It, it's from the Netherlands and it's called the Agenda case. Um, I'm sure some of you will have, will have heard of it. And in that uh, amazing case, I, I picked it out because as you can see here, lots of lawyers celebrating in the courtroom. 
um, it's one of the few cases that has actually gone ahead and won. It's gone all the way to the top court in the Netherlands. Uh, it succeeded in finding that the Dutch government um, had failed in its obligations to its citizens to take adequate action on climate change. So this is what lawyers, climate lawyers around the world are looking to uh, for inspiration uh, and, and eco-justice are, are no different. So let's focus now on, on the, the Ontario Targets case, which is, is the shorthand we, we use at eco-justice for this, this case. Um, this is the press conference that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and on the left there is, is Danielle Gallant, our Ottawa-based lawyer who is uh, giving the, the French section of our, our press conference with the clients uh, looking on. What's the case all about? Well, I mentioned earlier that Ontario did actually have some, some fairly decent climate legislation. Um, unlike Canada, Ontario had legislated climate targets. Uh, it had a pretty good target for 2030, uh, requiring a reduction of 37%, um, and then a, a steeper reduction required by 2050. The legislation required the government to prepare a plan setting out the measures to achieve those targets. All well and good. Unfortunately, uh, the Ford administration uh, came in and almost immediately repealed that legislation and re replaced it with something much weaker. The 2030 target went down from 37% to 30%. And the 2050 target, which is so crucial to achieve that 1.5 degrees under the Paris Agreement, went entirely. So there is now no 2050 target at all. Now, the impact of this will undoubtedly be that Ontario will emit more greenhouse gases in the coming years. Uh, that will contribute to the climate emergency and contribute to the effects of climate change that we're already starting to see, but that will increase in frequency and severity in the years and decades to come. Um, so I've mentioned a few on the slide there. Uh, heat waves, we're already seeing some absolutely staggering temperatures. Those heat waves kill people. Thousands of people will die or have to visit the hospital because of the effects of extreme heat. Similarly, we're seeing flooding all over Canada. We've seen uh, a couple of seasons of wildfires my abiding memory of my first trip to Vancouver was the 2017 wildfire season where the whole province was shrouded in, in smoke, thick smoke. Um, so that's one that, re that really resonates with me. Um, now these climate effects will lead to widespread illness and death. And that we say violates the rights of Ontarians to the charter protected rights to life, liberty, and security of the person. That's section seven of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That is really the, the core of our, of our case. We also argue that because young people are especially at risk, um, and that's because, well, quite simply, they will live longer. They will be around uh, to experience the more severe effects of climate change that are projected uh, for the, the, the latter decades, the latter, especially the latter half of, of this century. Um, so they will bear a disproportionate cost from the climate emergency, and that amounts to discrimination on the basis of age, contrary to the um, charter protected equality rights guaranteed under section 15. And that's the next slide really just uh, summarizes the, the case. And it's this focus on Ontario's inadequate 2030 target, which we say is unconstitutional because it will lead to those health effects. It will increase the risk of death and illness contrary to section seven of the charter. What we want to happen is for the court to rule that the legislation introducing that target 
is unconstitutional, unconstitutional and strike it down. Scrap it from the, the, the books and order the government of Ontario to replace it with a target that is adequate based on the scientific evidence of what is required to remain consistent with the obligations under the Paris Agreement. And uh, yeah, another picture of one of our superstar clients, completely unfazed by being surrounded by the cameras and the, and the media. I've talked a, a little bit about the clients, so I, I, I won't um, say too much more there. Um, I, I will say though that our two youngest clients are, are Sophia and Zoe. Um, and they say a little bit here about themselves and, and why they've uh, got involved in the case. You'll see Sophia references Greta Thunberg uh, and the Fridays for Future movement. Sophia was the first uh, the first young person in Canada to actually follow in Greta's footsteps and go on strike from school. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how uh, the, the teachers in the room will feel about uh, striking from school, so I won't say too much about that. Um, but yeah, I think it really speaks to the, the passion um, and commitment that these two brave young people have, have shown. Okay, why is the case important? Well, um, I think I've explained pretty, pretty carefully the, the climate impacts and, and the risk that will have to, to health. Um, I think another point to make is that climate change really doesn't respect uh, international, let alone provincial borders. Um, so it's critical that, that every province in Canada and every country in the world is doing all it can to reduce emissions as fast as possible um, to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and Ontario is one of the, the biggest and most polluting provinces in Canada, uh, has a really important role to play there. So we, we filed the case um, back in November 2019. Um, sorry, November 18. Uh, the, in December, we were disappointed, but not entirely surprised um, to learn that the government of Ontario had filed what's called a motion to strike. Now, essentially a motion to strike is, is an attempt to kill off the case right at the, the first step. Um, what the government is arguing is that there is, this case has no chance of reasonable chance of success. And so the court should, should throw it out. Now, to do that, they have quite a hard job on their hands uh, because the, the test that the courts set for succeeding on a motion to strike is a very high one. Um, it must be plain and obvious that the claims made in our case disclose no reasonable cause of action. Um, and in doing that, they must assume that all the facts that we have alleged in our statement of claim are, are true or capable of being proven when we finally get to trial, unless they are patently ridiculous or, or just incapable of proof. And that's really important because that's really what the, the government of Ontario have, have focused on. They are arguing that the, um, the climate targets and the climate legislation that, that we have focused on are not justiciable. Uh, so what they mean by that is that this really isn't something that the courts should get involved in. Climate policy, climate targets, it's really about politics. It's politicians' jobs to decide what our targets are and how we should get there. Uh, and it's not really a matter for the courts. Uh, they're also saying that the facts we've alleged around climate change, around future projections of, of the impacts of climate change, and critically, Ontario's contribution to those emissions and to those effects are incapable of being proven because there's this difficult causation, right? Climate change is this huge global problem. Uh, climate change doesn't respect national boundaries. They argue that it's, it's too difficult to draw cause and effect before, from the emissions we see in Ontario 
to the climate change impacts that we are alleging. And they're also arguing, and this is a little bit of a, a, a techie legal point, but that they're arguing that section seven of the charter, this right to life, liberty, and security of the person does not confer positive obligations on the government. So it doesn't require the government to do anything as such. Section seven is really all about protecting us from things that the government uh, does. So for example, if a, a policeman um, arrests you without due cause and beats you up and throws you in the back of a police car, then that's when section seven comes into play because it's about attacking or, or, or outlawing government action, which is causing impacts that harm life, liberty, and security of the person. Uh, fortunately, we had a, a hearing in July where we were able to, to, to make our case and, and refute these points. Um, we, wouldn't, we weren't sure if the case was going to go ahead, obviously because of, of COVID, uh, the courts had closed, um, but we went ahead with a, a virtual hearing, which was uh, my first one. Um, kind of strange uh, to see, especially seeing, seeing the judge um, doing the thing that we always do where we forget that we've muted ourselves. Um, but aside from some of the weirdness of, of the technology, it actually went, we thought, really well. And I might be biased by certainly thought we had the, uh, the better of the arguments. Uh, and what we are essentially saying is, no, the, the, these standards, these targets, this legislation, it is justiciable. This is absolutely the role of the courts. Uh, the courts can uh, and, and should require the government to take action that is constitutional. constitutional. Uh, and far from being facts that are incapable of being proven, um, we can and will, when we, if we get to court, we'll be able to lead evidence um, by scientists showing that the contribution Ontario is due to make under this new weak legislation just is nowhere near adequate to get us on that path to the Paris Agreement and 1.5 degrees. Now, unfortunately, one of the biggest frustrations about litigation is that we had that big day of excitement and now we just have to play the waiting game. The, the judge has taken um, both sides' arguments away and will make a decision at some point, we hope, in the next six months. But there, there, there really is no guarantees in, in terms of timing. Uh, we hope that we will survive that motion to strike. The judge will dismiss it. Uh, and then we will proceed to a full trial at some point in the, in the coming years where we'll get to really present the full case and the full evidence around not just the impacts uh, on people in Ontario from climate change, but around the inadequacy of, of Ontario's climate target. Okay, I will leave that there and look forward to taking your questions. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. So everyone, please, if you have any questions or comments for Alan, uh, please go ahead and drop them in the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, and while I'm, I'm giving you a moment to go ahead and, and do that, uh, Alan, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how these seven youth in particular came to you. How, how, how did you guys find each other? Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. We, we, we found each other in a way. We, we had this um, case that we were developing. We'd, we'd seen um, the agenda case from the Netherlands that I mentioned. Um, and as soon as we saw uh, the new weaker target come in, we thought, oh, we've, we've got to do something about this. This is a, a case that we, we need to bring. Um, we need some clients. Now, fortunately, um, it started with um, Sophia, the, the, the Canadian Greta Thunberg. Um, and it really started from there. We met Sophia. Um, we, we heard about her interest in, in climate change and talked to her about the, the case we were, we were developing. And it grew from there. She introduced us to various other people who were in this part of this climate movement. And we went from one, then we had three, and then eventually we, we had seven uh, so it was it was kind of yeah a, a little bit a little bit spontaneous um and yeah really what we see is a, a natural 
progression really from the climate action that they were already taking, working in their communities, uh, doing climate activism, and now it's that next stage in, in actually you know, signing on and being clients and, and getting involved in, in litigation. Wow, that's it's incredible. Um, I, I'm very interested by what you said about uh, the, the living tree doctrine, which I think most of our teachers will, will be familiar with from teaching uh, the Constitution. Uh, and particularly with the goal of having some element of, of constitutional inclusion to the right to a healthy healthy environment. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts on um, sort of what, what the next strategic steps are for, for pursuing that? Is, are you hoping that uh, a, an environmental right will be sort of read into Section 7 specifically? Uh, are you hoping for something something separate, a, a sort of positive rights reading of, of Section 7? Yeah, it's, I'd say our strategy is, is twofold. One, we will continue to use litigation um, to persuade the courts to read in, as you say, read in to some of the existing charter rights, um, rights to a healthy environment, rights to a stable climate. Um, and this is at the moment, the, the main way we're going to do that. We have other ideas for cases that we hope to get off the ground in the coming years. Um, but ultimately, it, it, it would also be really nice if we actually had explicit writing, um, recognizing that, that, that a right exists. Now, obviously, getting the Constitution amendment amended is really, really difficult. And, you know, can, can, you'll be familiar with the... Uh, the problems Canada has, has had trying to get constitutional amendments in the past. Um, so I think that's a, that is a, a long, a long-term goal. I think ultimately it has to be our, our vision, but there are other things that we can do in terms of law reform in the interim that, that start to take us closer to that. Um, so for example, we could look at uh, having an environmental bill of rights. Uh, so not an, not an actual constitutional text but legislation which guarantees particular processes you know the right to access information about air pollution or the the right to go to court when uh, an environmental law is broken right. Right. Um, so i think that these kinds of laws are really important in in building these kinds of norms uh, around environmental rights so it's that that twin approach of law reform and litigation that makes sense um, we've had a question come in asking, um, have there been any other cases that have set a precedent for, for or against the government's argument about positive obligations under Section 7? Yes, uh, the, the case that springs to mind and the case that they've um, relied on quite heavily in their arguments and again at the hearing was a case called Tanuj Tanujaja. Um, we can send around a, a link to that case. Um, after the webinar, but the, the Tanajaja case um, was about housing, and, and the argument was that um, there was some kind of positive obligation on government to provide adequate housing. Um, now that case, um, that case failed because the, the court ruled that it was really hard to find a justiciable, measurable standard. I mean, what is adequate housing? Right. Um, and so we've distinguished our case from Tana Jaja because unlike this rather vague notion of a, a right to adequate housing, we know what the right to a safe and stable climate looks like because we have the Paris Agreement and we have this wealth of scientific evidence where we can actually point to the actual tons of GHG emissions that we're allowed uh, and the targets that we have to hit to have a reasonable chance of, of success at, at maintaining that. So yeah, really good question and, and get, really gets to the heart of what this case is, is all about. And successfully distinguishing our case from that one will be, will be the key to success. Some fascinating implications for international law in Canada as well. I know, um, I, I'm sure you're aware, but the, the grade 12 law curriculum in Ontario is heavily focused on international law and so this is a, an interesting jumping off point for thinking about how also 
international obligations end up impacting sort of domestic commitments and, and that process. Um, yeah, ab absolutely. And it, it's really interesting, but also really frustrating when you see these international obligations not really having the, the desired effect, uh, not being implemented through national legislation. Um, that's a, that's a, one of these traits of, of Commonwealth jurisdictions like Canada, like the UK, and until that those international treaties are implemented um, at the domestic level, they, they don't have much in the way of, of legal effect. Because am I right in thinking that Canada would have entered uh, the Paris Agreement and, and subsequent accords voluntarily, that this was a, an obligation that uh, our, our, the Canadian government chose to take on itself? Yeah, and that, that's one of, the, one of the interesting features about the Paris Agreement is that it, it departed from previous treaties. The, the Kyoto Protocol famously was a kind of top-down allocation that said, okay, each country must, here is the target for each country, here is what you must do. Paris replaced that with a, a more, it's kind of like, a, like an honesty box approach. Each country makes a, a voluntary, um, nationally determined contribution, NDC. Each country determines for itself what it thinks it can and, and should achieve in terms of a, a climate target. Um, I and there's a lot of academic uh, debate uh, around, <laughs> around whether that was the, the right approach. I, I think pragmatically, I think it was the, the only option, given the failures we'd seen with the Kyoto Protocol, Canada withdrawing from it, other countries doing the same, lots of countries failing completely to meet their targets. What it means, though, is that because we have this um, honesty box system, each country has to come, come up with their own voluntary targets, it makes it even more important that we have pressure brought to bear on national governments and provincial governments um, by their citizens to ensure that the targets that they're putting forward are adequate in the light of science. Uh, that ties so well into uh, the next question that I have for you here uh, from the audience, which is sort of about what, what kind of um, political support uh, you think is needed from either political parties or from, or from the public uh, to help to help get you closer to your goals. Uh, that's, that's a really good question, um, and one I'm I'm asked quite a lot because I think there's a danger um, that we see law and these kinds of legal cases as being some kind of wonder weapon, some kind of silver bullet. We go to court, we win this big case, and and the world suddenly changes. And unfortunately, it's, it's just not like that. Litigation is only effective where it takes place as part of a broader movement. Um, there's some really interesting scholarship, mainly drawing on the experience of strategic litigation in the, in the civil rights movement in the US um, that, that really makes that case. I, I've, from my own experience, I've, I've been on the, the, the wrong end of that. I've seen great cases uh, that I've been involved in not really deliver a change on the ground um, where you don't have that, that broader societal shift. Um, so I think what I hope with this case and other cases that eco-justice brings and will bring in the future is really that they act as a, a catalyst, a, a focal point for that broader movement. Um, we've already seen like the tremendous outpouring of um, protest around climate change sparked by the, the Greta Thunberg Fridays for Future movement. Ultimately, that is what politicians will listen to. Uh, our cases can only take politicians so far. There's only so far the courts will be willing to go in ordering the government to do certain things. Ultimately, it's the government that will have to, to walk those hard yards, and they'll only do that um, when they feel pressure from voters. So, yeah, I think it's really important we continue to see um, this building momentum around popular protest, um, people getting out there and, and voting, ballot box power, and that all being reflected and amplified through the traditional media and, and social media. Great. Um, I was wondering if you, if you have any recommendations off the top about 
resources that teachers can use in helping their students learn about things like the Paris Agreements, things like uh, Canada's international uh, obligations and commitments um, when it comes to the global climate change movement. Are you aware of anything that's out there that can be useful in classrooms? Um, this is a pop question. Yeah, <laughs> it's, we it's, didn't it's, ask you to bring this. <laughs> no, it's I, 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 I'm not to be honest. I'm not aware of it, um, and you know, maybe that speaks to a gap. Maybe there is a gap in in having that readily accessible material, which which kind of translates what can often be quite abstract, quite complex, legally jargony mm -hmm. material and into something that people can engage with. Um, I, I'll have a think about it and I'll, I'll check in on the eco justice hive mind because I'm sure they, they've, right. they've got some ideas, but I, I do, I do suspect uh, as in a lot of cases with the environment and law, um, the materials out there aren't, aren't great. Right. I, this is probably the right time to mention that actually OGEN and ICFO Justice are hoping to work together on a, a short educational resource for high school teachers in Ontario about this case particular, in particular. So I, I don't want to presume or imply that, uh, that we're going to be able to cover the whole Paris Agreement, but hopefully as, as the case evolves and, and hopefully gets past this, this motion to strike, uh, we may be able to offer something in that regard. Um, I have another question here um, that says that uh, you had you had mentioned in your opening that Canada is quite behind in environmental laws. Um, what specific areas have other countries really moved ahead with? And can you give us any examples off the top of your head? Sure, I, I would say the the biggest and best example of where Canada needs to go is is coming forward with a, a comprehensive what we call Climate Accountability Act. What we want to see is Canada legislate its targets, uh, contain very clear legally binding obligations to achieve targets by a certain date. But then crucially to, to give us what we call accountability mechanisms, give us some of the procedural tools um, to allow Canadians to hold governments to account. For, for making progress on, on that target. And the example that we draw on is the, is the UK Climate Change Act from 2008, um, which in its day was really innovative because what it tried to address was what um, a famous Canadian, um, Mark Carney, uh, that strange and rare beast of a popular um, Bank of England governor, um, he, he described climate change as the tragedy of the horizon. This idea that in order to tackle climate change, we need to take action um, now and for many, many decades in order to, to safeguard the climate. But unfortunately, our political processes and the way companies work is on a much shorter time horizon. Politicians are only really thinking about getting elected at the next election, companies are only thinking about the next profit forecast or the next shareholder dividend. So the UK Climate Change Act tries to address that problem by saying, okay, here is the 2050 target. Here's the long-term legal obligation. This is where we need to get to. But then breaking that down into five-year interim targets, which they call carbon budgets. Um, so that way we get to see every five years, okay, is our government on track? And when they're not, you can then do something about it. They, the government then faces political pressure, it faces media criticism, and it could face legal action, it could face uh, a case brought before the courts um, requiring them to take further action. Um, the UK Climate Change Act has since been copied by many jurisdictions around the world, uh, many of them being in Europe, but actually most recently, my own personal favorite is I think the New Zealand Climate Change Act, is, is probably now the, the best in class and it has overtaken the UK in that regard. So in our law reform efforts, we're really pushing that model uh, as being one of the, the solutions to addressing Canada's inadequate climate laws. Interesting to hear you name uh, mostly common law countries in that list too. You know, the kinds of countries that Canada is used to measuring itself against and that I think Canadians like to think of themselves as sort of 
uh, keeping keeping up with or or in conversation with somehow. Um, a very very closely related question that's come in is uh, can you can you talk about any other countries with common law that have successfully argued that climate change is an obligation that or you know uh, managing climate change is an obligation that must be met by the government uh, and ideally who appear to be on a positive path to meeting this goal <laughs> well one important case I, I should mention is, is a, a case from the US, that's the Our Children's Trust case. Mm -hmm. um, that has not yet succeeded, uh, unfortunately, but it has made some significant progress. Um, it's a very similar case to the, the Ontario case I've talked about. Big group of, of youth who have argued that the federal US government has, has breached their constitutional rights by failing to address climate change. Um, that survived a motion to strike a couple of years ago um, and is now wending its way through the uh, ridiculously complex US legal system. Um, so that's one to watch. Uh, in terms of successes, um, there's a very interesting case in Pakistan, which is also a, a Commonwealth jurisdiction, um, which, is, which is worth looking at and did suggest that, that there are some some rights on uh, some obligations on government to address climate change um, but in terms of commonwealth obligations that there, there aren't that many out there there was uh, just this week a really interesting sorry just last week i think it was a really interesting irish case um, friends of the irish environment um, which held irish ireland also like the uk has some pretty decent climate legislation imposing legally binding obligations on government to achieve targets through preparation of, of plans. Interestingly, the court, um, the Supreme Court in, in Ireland upheld the, the case, uh, held that the government's climate plans were inadequate, didn't comply with the, the requirements of the legislation, uh, but rejected the argument that there was uh, some kind of constitutional right um, so yeah, it's, there aren't that many great examples out there. It's going to be a very, a very tough road ahead. Uh, but as I, as I said, I think these, these rights to life, liberty and security of the person, for example, are, are meaningless unless they, they are founded on a, a right to a healthy environment and stable right. climate. Um, and I think the better examples we, we tend to see have been from those countries like the Netherlands, where they have enshrined uh, an explicit right to a healthy environment in their constitutions. Great. Um, I guess one thing that we've also been wondering about is, uh, do you have any advice in general for young people who are interested in environmental activism or are there, are there opportunities for young people to get involved with eco justice or with supporting the, the litigation or law reform efforts or anything that is going on in a positive way? Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, sign up to our mailing list, be, be, <laughs> become, a, become an eco-justice supporter. Um, uh, yeah, certainly getting engaged with environmental groups like eco-justice, uh, there, are, there are other environmental organizations out there, I'm told. Um, but I, I think, you know, like, like our clients here, really, really getting involved um, in local climate activism, finding out what's going on in their communities, finding out how they can um, address the climate emergency at that real local level. Um, how can they make their voices heard um, in their community, in their school, with their family? You know, can they talk about climate change to their parents um, and their teachers and explain why they're concerned about climate change? Because I think, I think for a lot of middle-aged adults, uh, climate change is like, it, you know, it's there, it's a problem, but mm -hmm. you've got so many other things going on, bills to pay and a job to do that sometimes it's, it's helpful to be reminded uh, by younger people who are gonna bear these, these more severe impacts of, of why it's important and why we should all be taking action. Right. Well, and there's the, there's the question of priorities. Excuse me for the background noise just now. There's the question of priorities, and there's also, of course, the, the vast amount of uh, misinformation and misunderstanding of some of the, some of the goals and the emergencies. Um, 
is, is hard for people to deal with and, and wade through. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the era of fake news, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to separate you know, tr truth from truth from lies. And unfortunately, the, the fossil fuel industry has been very successful at, at sowing those seeds of doubt, at sowing misinformation around climate change. Uh, and unfortunately, we have seen that stall progress. But I, I think we've reached a point now where you're seeing even some of the big fossil fuel majors, seeing some of these big multinational corporations committing to net zero emissions. I, I really hope we're past the, the point of, oh, is climate change real? Right. And getting to the point of, okay, well, let's have the, the tough conversation about, okay, how are we going to address it? So, so maybe we've, we've, we've seen a shift. Um, it's too early to tell, I think, whether COVID will, will stymie that shift. I mean, we've seen, seen in the past, 2008 being most recently, how progress on climate change stalled the moment we had an economic crisis. And, and here we have a, an economic crisis of, of unparalleled magnitude. Right. Uh, what we hope is that the world uses this as an opportunity as it tries to resurrect the economy, as it tries to stimulate um, spending and investment. It does that in a way that is focused on the Paris Agreement and focused on, on clean, low carbon infrastructure. It certainly sounds like um, finding ways to sort of transfer political power and priority to young people who, as you say, are going to have such a longer, longer horizon to live with the results um, is going to be an important part of that. Absolutely. So uh, we are at 4.30 and I'm mindful of everyone's time. Alan, I want to say thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, we do the Summer Law Institute professional development event for teachers every year and have for about 15 years. And uh, for as long as I have been with OGEN, which is quite a few years, uh, one of our top requests from teachers for more guidance and support and, and resources is around uh, environmental law. So it, it's such a such a delight for us to have you here and uh, able to answer some questions directly um, and share the great work of the young people that you're working with. So uh, on behalf of OGEN, thank you so much for your time and for being here. Um, uh, we'll make sure that we get uh, the, everything that was referred to in this presentation, including links to a, a couple cases. Um, maybe we'll, we'll find some information on our agenda. Uh, and certainly on um, the mother litigation uh, and make sure that that's available for, for attendees after the fact. Great, and thank you for the opportunity. An absolute delight. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, hopefully you're already aware, we will be having a couple more sessions in our Transfer to Online Summer Law Institute webinar series. Coming up on August 13th, we have a three-person panel on how COVID-19 has affected uh, a couple of key areas of law, including uh, housing law, immigrate, um, excuse me, employment, and uh, how the criminal courts are dealing with, with COVID. On August 26th, we'll be talking about fertility law in Canada, uh, and there will be a bit of a focus on uh, the implications for surrogacy and reproductive technology on gender nonconforming people, uh, trans folks, as well as, as um, all couples who have access to that technology. And on August 27th, we will be presenting a, a classic Summer Law Institute, Law Institute staple, which is uh, an overview of new resources that we have to offer from OGEN. And we'll be talking a little bit about what you can expect from us and how we can support you as educators in this coming year that is going to be this, this strange online in-person all broken up uh, sort of format. Uh, so thank you everyone for your time. Have an absolutely great day.